and uh, I should say good morning and good evening, everyone. This is Nitin Ramachandra from the NR Hour Sports Show. This is episode 724. With We're joined by my co-host from the GT2 Sports Talk, Julian and Bobby. And also we're joined by special guest, Dan Straley. He's a pitcher. He pitched in the majors, but now he, pitched in the K- he pitches in Korea, KBO League, with the Lodi Giants. Um, I just want to say thank you for joining us. This is truly an honor. And uh, first of all, how are you and your family doing so far d- uh, during this sub situation? Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. No problem. Um, yeah, every- everything's about perspective, right? So uh, last year we did this, uh, me out here in Korea by myself, my family back in Oregon dealing with this, you know, at the, at the time, this newfound <clears throat> like pandemic that we have a little bit better understanding of. But uh, it was a lot scarier last year going through all this, having – having them apart and not knowing what was going on. Now, at least we have a little bit idea of the chaos and everything else that's going on around us. So, um, yeah, we're, we're happy to have happy to be out here together, uh, adjusted to Korean life. My son's going to school, going to Taekwondo. Um, it's a lot more life is normal out here than it was back in the States for us, at least when, uh, when we left. Oh, wow. So, um, I'm going to let, uh, Bobby or Julian start off here and then we'll go in rotation. Right. Jules, you could go first, bro. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. So I'm going to ask you, what was the most rewarding part about your major league experience? I think it's just like any anything else that you, you strive to do in life. Um, you know, I had a goal and I'm still chasing that goal. But that goal was to wasn't just to get there. Right. Like, it, I feel like it's just just to say you played in the major leagues is one thing. But to say that you had a career is another and uh, I've my whole goal has just been to put together a career that I'm proud of. And, um, you know, I detail it a lot in my in my own podcast, but talking about like how like my my career is a lot more the the version that is is the wide told story of baseball players, not just the, the few superstars that get a chance to play for like, you know, the hundred plus million dollar contracts like that's that's not me. And. Um, just very proud of what I've been able to, to bring to the table and what I've been able to accomplish so far in my, my 13 year career. Absolutely. So being in the major leagues, I do have a question for you. Who is the toughest hitter you've ever went up against? I mean, that's, that's pretty easy to say. It's just, it's Mike Trout. I mean, that's, <laughs> um, I've been facing Mike since we were both drafted in the same year and I've been facing him. Uh, since high A or low A ball and it's he, obviously he's just gotten better um, but it's like as soon as you like kind of show him what you're trying to do or how you're trying to get him out like he just adjusts faster than anybody and I think his skill set is just just that super it's just that much better than everybody else and uh, you know it's it's crazy to think that you know how much different of a, a superstar he could even be had he played on an east coast team and to just think like the, the persona of what Mike Trout could be if he played on a different team on the East Coast, uh, where it's just things get covered and, you know, people aren't sleeping while he's hitting homers every night and that type of thing. So, uh, but it's just, uh, it's, it's pretty much a no doubt answer. Uh, Mike Trout, the toughest hitter. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to I ask you, take me back uh, to your, uh, obviously, your major league debut and how grateful are you that the Oakland A's gave you the first opportunity to start your career? Yeah, that was a while ago. Um, <laughs> in 2012, uh, the the big league debut is something pretty cool. I mean, you you work really hard for this, right? And everybody's working hard, and it's just a matter of waiting for somebody, waiting for your boss to call your name. Yeah. And uh, for me, it was something being a low draft pick that it was the it was the goal and it was the dream, but it wasn't something that you know it wasn't something guaranteed from from the moment I got drafted type of thing. And so to see that come to fruition uh, relatively quick, I mean, I only had two and a half years really in the minor leagues before I was, before I was called up to the big leagues. And so um, relatively quick compared to a lot of, a lot of other guys, but just like the gratification of knowing that like, I'm at least what I'm doing is working and somebody out there thinks that what I'm doing is good enough to get out to the major leagues. uh, It's just a a great feeling. Um, I had a lot of people come down uh, Oregon uh, is where I'm from. And so Oregon, obviously being right above California allowed for a lot of my family to just, and friends to just drive down. And there was like, I don't even know how many people, I don't remember how many people, a lot of people came and our game ended up going 18 innings on my major league debut. So oh, wow. a lot of my <laughs> friends and family met us back at the hotel lobby at like 2 AM to yeah. like <laughs> say hi for 10 seconds before 
some of my buddies even drove back to Oregon that night. Cause they had to be at work the next morning at like 10. So like, it was just like, it was crazy how, how <laughs> everything went down that day. But, um, it was just like one of those moments of like, it's kind of like anything else, like any other big milestone you get to, it's like, you know, I, I got there. It's like, okay, now the real work starts, mm-hmm. you know, it's like getting drafted. Yeah. That's a great accomplishment, but now the real work starts. And so that was kind of the same mentality, the same kind of thing I had with that, uh, with getting called up to the big leagues was like, okay, I got here. Now the question is, how do I stay here? Right. That's a really cool experience. And there's a lot that goes into that, obviously. Oakland was the first team you went to, but you had several other stops. So I'm curious, which team was your favorite stop? Like what city felt the most like home to you? I mean, Cincinnati felt the most like home to me. Um, But that's, I grew up in a small town in the middle of nowhere. And so being able to just kind of be five minutes and kind of be out in the country in Kentucky was uh, nice. You know, it's just need to clear my head, like just go for a quick drive and you're in the, you're in the country pretty quick on that side of the river. Um, I, I really enjoyed that stop, but to be quite honest, I've really found something in every single city that like, I had no clue was there that I just like loved. Like every, every spot I've played in has been like, it just, you get to experience so much culture uh, so much different food, so much different, just landscape, so much different, just ways of life. You know, I, being a kid from the Pacific Northwest, like I'd never, I was first time I was on an airplane was when I went to college. Hmm. I'd never been like East of Idaho until I was 18. So it was like, for me to like, just get out there and like, go see a different part of the world. Um, and then to like being, I was, I was in West Virginia and I got to travel a little bit in college and then getting into the pro Bowl, obviously and all the cities I've played in, if you pull up the list, like the city, it's like, I think it's over like 20 something cities that I've called home cities hmm. in terms of all the minor league stops and everything else, wow. but just getting a chance to just see all that, all that life experience and all that diversity that I've, that I've run into has really been an incredible part of this journey that I never expected. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Traveling, <clears throat> being in the major leagues, being able to see different cities, is something awesome like that. But uh, my question for you now is, who did you look up to growing up uh, as a pitcher? Was there a pitcher you wanted to emulate, wanted to be like? I I loved watching Andy Pettit. I thought he oh, was Andy, like, right. I thought he was like the man. And uh, my two my two favorite players. I was actually a catcher when I was really young, oh. and I was born in Southern California, so I was a big Piazza fan. So I inadvertently became growing up watching two New York sports teams most of the time, which was obviously watching Pettit pitch and, and Piazza like every single day I could, but like, just like Andy's like tenacity and his like just ability, like he never looked rattled. He never looked, if anything, he looked angry. And I loved that, even though he probably was calm as could be. Um, but yeah, the cool story about that too is uh, my very first start in Yankee stadium was against Andy Really? And, wow. Oh, wow. And so a couple of days before I was like out, we threw bullpens and I was like out jogging and he's just like, Hey, go over there and I'll meet you in the corner and we can do a couple of these, these polls together. And I was just like, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Like, I didn't know what to say. I was just like, what? And he just wanted to introduce himself and say hi. And, and I ended up doing way more conditioning than I probably planned on that day. Hmm. Uh, Cause Andy wanted to talk as we jogged. So, uh, but yeah, no, I definitely grew up uh, a big Andy fan. Um, and, uh, I just, I thought it was just an incredible how he was able to piece it together every single year for like, well, like 20 something years. It seemed like. Yeah. Andy Pettit's awesome, man. He really <laughs> no, is. Man. That, uh, that story is really cool. Yeah. Andy Pettit, he's just got that laser focus and I got to add, he's got the greatest pickoff move in baseball. I can't, I don't think anybody oh, yeah. else could compare to what he does with that. That's amazing. Yeah. Something yeah, like- that I've been jealous of. Obviously it can't be a left-handed pitcher, but that's been uh, <laughs> that was a special move. I mean, you could probably tell we're Yankees guys, so we're pretty hyped to hear yeah. you talk about Andy Pettit. Yeah, we're I can see it over your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Just to feel it, right? <laughs> yeah, so I got to ask you, though, um, obviously you, you play with a lot of different teams in the majors, but I want to get to one team, Chicago Cubs. Actually, I had Rafael Palmero on before you today, and uh, he played oh, for the nice. Cubs. Yeah, he played for the Cubs, too, obviously. And uh, what, what was your experience like in Chicago playing in Wrigley Field and playing in front of those fans? dude i i was i was a chicago cub for about a minute it was uh it was 30 to 30 days that uh, i was there because then it was the off season and i got traded to houston but uh i, I want to say i think we were like in last place hmm. and we had this rookie named 
Kyle Hendricks that just came up that was pitching yeah. pretty decent. And it was yep. the first, it was the first year that anyone ever really heard of, uh, or not heard of, but it was the first year that Jake Arietta was like the, uh, like the, the new version of Jake. Huh. Um, we had, there was Chris Bryant was in triple a, uh, Javi Baez had just made his debut. Like, it was like, there was a lot of excitement around the Cubs young core when I was there. Um, and you know, I got traded over there with Addison Russell, who obviously everyone knew was coming. But the one thing that I did love about being a Cub was that we were in last place, I believe. And every time we won, you thought it was like the coolest thing ever at home. Like I was only a Cub in the big leagues for a month. And I think we had like 20 home games that month, which was pretty cool. But just seeing like the, I hadn't, I hadn't played, it came from Oakland. So I hadn't played in front of like a packed house on a Tuesday ever. And so to like go do that every day in Chicago was pretty unbelievable just to be a part of that for a few minutes. And even though like I was essentially like, I wasn't necessarily hurt, I could still throw, but I was definitely not a hundred percent when I was there. It really kind of put a damper on the whole experience. Cause I was just like trying really hard just to get on the field every single day. Uh, it wasn't really the best version of myself, but the, the atmosphere and everything else was probably one of the cooler places I've played. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds really fun. You know, Wrigley seems like a really cool place. Bobby's been there before, so I love it. I want to try to get there too at one point. But I'm actually going to ask you about another trade you were involved in. Um, when you were sent to the Marlins for Luis Castillo, what was going through your mind with that? How did that go down? I'm also curious if you knew anything about Castillo at the time. Obviously, it turned out to be great, but that was a very interesting trade, I thought. I don't think anybody knew anything about Castillo at the time. Yeah. I mean, he was in he was in high A. How many how many high A guys do you yeah, know about right point. now? <laughs> you know, what I mean, like that's and so uh, obviously the Marlins were trying to get rid of him. They traded him to San Diego, then he came back um, after that whole debacle, and then they traded him up wow. to Cincinnati. So like, but you never know what you get. You never know what you got in the minor leagues, right? That's why it's a it's a prospect. That's why it's every you know you don't you don't know what's gonna happen. Um, but I really was caught off guard. Like I thought I was gonna be there for a while. I just just got handed a trophy being named the the pitcher of the year in Cincinnati um thought everything was going great and like there but you know I got a call in the middle of out of absolutely out of the blue um I got traded on the same day actually I got traded to the January 19th I got traded to from Chicago to to Houston and on January 19th I got traded from wow. Cincinnati to Miami but I was uh driving over to my buddy's house my buddy just bought a new place and I was going over to check it out and uh, I get a call from my agent, like, right as we're pulling into the driveway. And then, like, oh, halfway God. through, like, halfway through, like, him touring the house, he's like, are you guys okay? And I was like, dude, we just found out four minutes ago we got traded. So, like, I'm sorry, but <laughs> we're a little – mine's a little off off right now. But, the um, no, it's, it's – honestly, as being a ball player, like, you just – you get to go wherever you're told. You get to play whenever you're told it's your turn to play. Um very few guys, very few guys get to dictate those types of things. Um, and that's just kind of part of being an athlete is you're going to go, whoever's going to pay you for your services, right? Like you're just going to go and you're going to go give everything you got for whatever Jersey you're wearing. That's why as a fan, you're most often you're a fan of, of the team, not necessarily individual players because players can change. But when you do find those players that, that you fall in love with, like they tend to be also the same guys that stay on the same teams for 20 years. Right. And so it kind of makes it easier in that part, but just really being a ball player, like you, I, by this time in my career, like I wasn't really shocked getting traded. This one caught me off a little bit just because I thought I didn't, I didn't expect this one. Hmm. Um, other times, a lot of times you're kind of tipped off a little bit ahead of time. Like, Hey, the, you know, you're being shopped around or, Hey, uh, we're, we're, we got something in the works. Like they, they're, most teams are pretty open about it and pretty upfront with you. Cause no one wants to, to burn bridges and, and have bad blood in the water when, when things get, you know, go down so unexpectedly. Yeah, it's a tough business for sure. Absolutely. That is it's really tough. You never know what's gonna happen. One day you're you're one place, the next day you could be on the opposite side of the country. It's it's yeah, definitely stressful. My uh you know what my question for you now is um what is your most memorable strikeout and who is it against? Ooh, that's a good question. That is a good question. Hmm. Most memorable. I, I mean, it might be just be my very first. It was a 13 pitch at bat. Wow. Uh, first, first, first batter I ever faced in the big leagues. And Brett Laurie and 
just got a chance to like struck him out with a fastball down at the knees down the middle. Like I, well, I've seen the video a number of times and it might've been a little low, but umpire gave it to the, the kid making his debut, gave, <laughs> gave him the call. Um, but just getting that first one out of the way on the first hitter uh, is something that I was, I can't say I was proud of in the moment. I was probably scared shitless just trying to get through the, <laughs> just trying to get through the inning at this point. Um, but that one was pretty, uh, that one's pretty memorable. Other than that, like, like there's been, you know, it's just part of the game. It's just kind of like part of something that happens. There's a series of events that led up to, I struck out Tory Hunter three times in wow. the playoffs in a single game. Yeah. And Tory was my daddy. And so <laughs> like, I'm talking like Tory was six for eight with three homers mm -hmm. and two doubles off me yeah. going into this game. And I struck him out three times. And so that might've been a pretty memorable sequence for me right there. Um, now that you say this, you got me thinking there's a couple more I could think <laughs> of too. There's a Ian Kensler one in Texas. Uh, we we're in the playoff race and uh, the catcher comes out to me, Derek Norris and just goes, Hey, you just don't shake me. I got this whole sequence here. Just don't shake me. And we got second and third one run game in like the fifth or sixth inning. And he comes out and he's like slider, 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 slider. We're three, two fighting off pitches. And he's like fastball down and away, strike three looking. And it was like, this place went from like just packed house, sold out crowd, just ear, just like, just mind like throbbing in my ears from like all the noise to just dead silence. Hmm. And it just completely ended the rally. And that one, I guess those are probably the the three. I don't know if I could really pick one that's like the absolute top one, but those are probably like the three that I remember the most. That's wow. That's crazy. That's that's awesome. The for your first strikeout, thirteen pitch at bat in your first start. My God, the, that yeah. now my you know was that the first batter too? Like it was yeah, just that was oh, oh, oh God, thirteen. Yeah, I had the bullpen going in the first inning of my big league debut, and nothing <laughs> happened. Oh wow but they didn't want the kid to come up and throw 45 pitches in the first, like nothing happened. It's just that 13 pitch at bat. Like people don't realize how much I like shortens a pitcher's outing. Uh, and it's a happen. Your first hitter of the game is like not ideal, especially the first yeah. game, the first hitter of your first game. It's just like, Oh gosh, these hitters are tough up here. Yeah. That's some battle. Definitely. For your first <laughs> this American <time>. league, <laughs> this American league is a tough league. Yeah. So, um, well, actually, what do you say? Um, so obviously you experienced a lot of cities and teams. So what do you say that um, it, it was an easy transition for you? Uh, obviously, it's, it's always hard for people when they go to a different country. But for you, experience different cities and teams. Was, was it an easy transition for you to the KBO League, KBO, KBO League in Korea? Or No. No? No. It was like I thought like places I've been, you feel like – you walk into a clubhouse and it's uncomfortable at first. Like these guys are all boys. They know each other. Like you're the new guy, but like walking into a room of 50 people that you can't communicate with any of them. Like I was like, I got this. And I walk in and I'm just like, Oh, intimidation. You're like, I can't speak to any of you guys. Hello. Um, I don't even know if you understand what that means, but hi, how you doing? And it was just super uncomfortable at first. And then I started realizing that 80% of the guys around me can speak English at right. some level. And <laughs> I started realizing that some of them really understand everything I'm saying, even if they can't communicate back. Uh, I started realizing, oh, this guy played in America for a while. Oh, that guy played in America for a while. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Like it's so like the, the buildup of it, of getting into this uncomfortable situation of being the new guy on a foreign land on a foreign team was like, it was tough at first. And then you throw in this whole coronavirus stuff at the time that was really making things uncomfortable because now my teammates were terrified because they were, we were all in Australia and the team that obviously were based out of South, South Korea. So we were in Australia and this country got shut down. So South Korea did because of COVID last year for a while. Right. And so we got stuck in Australia, which isn't the worst place in the world to get stuck by the way. And so we were there for like two or three extra weeks, but all my teammates were like panicked because their families were all at, stuck at home in quarantine. Wow. Um, and so like you throw all those circumstances in and then I finally get to come to South Korea and they're like, Hey, looks great out there. It looks like a lot of fun, but like, let's try not to leave your house too much. You're still got a lot of lockdowns going on. And so like, none of it was like, none of it was like terribly hard. It was probably harder in my mind. It ended up being, but 
it was just like the whole process of it, the whole, everything that was involved made the transition a little harder, I think, than a normal year, a non COVID year would have been. Yeah, I, that's actually a great point. And I'm going to stay with the KBO because last year before we had baseball, we were watching the KBO a lot because there was not much else on. Oh, yeah, we were, were having some fun with it. <laughs> it was really cool to see. So I'm going to ask you, I don't know how you can put this in perspective, but how would you say the competition level varies? Like how does it compare to Major League Baseball? That's like, uh, I get that question a lot. And I pretty much have figured out the answer to this question. Hmm. It doesn't, first of all, it doesn't compare. There's nothing that compares to MLB baseball. Now, what people always try to put like a, a triple A, a double A on the league, right? Like mm -hmm. to me, that is absolutely impossible. And it does like a disservice to like what any of the other leagues would be because it's just so different. Like everything about it is different. Like um, you'll be facing a lineup and you could face a guy that would be in the big leagues that could be a major league baseball player. And then you are in the same lineup, you might face a guy that would be a triple A ball player. And you also might face a guy that would be an A ball. Like you just, it, 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 it ranges like the, the talent is just ranges so much. And the talent pool is just so much smaller than that's probably part of it. But like, we have guys on our team that were in high school last year, like legitimately. Oh, wow. huh. And I also have a guy on my team that's 42. So <laughs> like, you just kind of like, we have, we have a great age range. Mm -hmm. So to like sit there and like, say like, it's, just like triple a or people like to throw around like oh it's probably is it somewhere between triple a and the big leagues or is it you know it's just like it's a really tough comparison um there really is not a good comparison because it's really about the players on the field at the time like the whole as a league like you could, i have no idea where you could where you could plop this down because you put any of these teams in a triple a league like they're gonna do great <laughs> And like, you know what I mean? It's baseball. Yeah. Like you're going to have good days and bad days. You put any right. of this, these teams there, they're going to do, they're going to be just fine. Right. And so like, it's really, it's really hard to compare it, but I would say like every team has like a few guys that are in, in the top of each one of these leagues. I can definitely understand that because we see talent from the KBO get signed in the MLB too. I mean, you made a good point about the contrast in the age with high school guys and guys in the forties. So that actually answers my question perfectly because I was thinking, is it between AAA and MLB? I'm like, is it like a AAA? So I'm really yeah. happy with that. Well, like, for example, I saw a guy the other day that was in high school last year that was pitching against our team and his first fastball was like 97. Oh, wow. And like, but that's exactly. And that's wow here. That's that's wow in America. But that's every club has those guys. Yeah. Now over here, that guy will be the hardest over in the league. Right. Like potentially, like he could be the hardest over here. And so it's just like, there's just not seven of those guys on each team. And that's kind of like a, a difference maker. So like, but if that guy goes down for any reason or it doesn't perform, like it, you know, it kind of starts to level the playing field a little bit. So it's just different. Uh, yeah. But the, I think just the overall, the, it's just the whole league is just the style of play. Everything is just a little bit different. Definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, I'm going to ask you, it's kind of a cliche answer. In your opinion, a uh, cliche question I might add, um, who in your opinion is the best pitcher in baseball right now? Hmm. I mean, I haven't watched a whole lot of baseball from the States right now. Um, so you're asking me that, right? Like, Who's the best pitcher in, in MLB? Yeah. Yeah. Um, starters, closers, relievers? Uh, what are we talking you know here? What? You know what? Uh, starters – Starter, the starters, the starters, and relief. Who's the oh, okay. best starter and best reliever? Um, I mean, I I feel like you have to say Bieber is pretty much up there mm -hmm. with just being unanimous. Uh, the Cy Young. I love watching him pitch. The first time I saw him pitch, he struck out 15 guys on my team, and I was just like, "Who is this guy?" <laughs> and he's just like, "This guy just doesn't miss. Everything's just dotted at the bottom of the zone and in the dirt." Like that was. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're really splitting hairs here. You could make an argument for like any of the top guys between him, Cole, DeGrom. Yeah. I think you could sit there and just say Walker, Bueller. Like you could go back and forth with so many players, like who's the top arm. Um, but I really like watching him. I'm also uh, like watching guys that uh, team up with Codify, a company that does a lot of uh, uh, like advanced scouting work. And mm -hmm. he's one of the clients there. So I like, I like watching guys with that because I work with them too. So I like seeing that. And then relievers. I think it'd be hard pressed to talk, not talk about Liam Hendricks being one of the top yeah. relievers right now in the game. I mean, just signed a, a really nice deal to go play for the White Sox. 
Um, but then again, there's so many arms that are just getting it done all the time um, that, uh, that it's just kind of, it's really hard to, to pinpoint one guy, but if you had to go, go Bieber to, to Hendricks, I think you'd be pretty happy. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, oh, that's absolutely. why I said it's a very uh, simple question. You know, uh, definitely, I agree with you. Bieber's awesome. Mm -hmm. Me being a big Yankees guy, Garrett Cole is always up there. DeGrom, of course. Uh, I think Cast going back to Castillo, I think he's really good. I think he's underrated. Liam Hendricks yeah. is up there. I do. I'm going to be a little bit of a homer. I think that uh, – uh, Roldis Chapman is up there too. I think he's. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. You can't argue with 100 mile, like 101, 102. <laughs> 10, what, what was the fastest? Yeah. It's like 105, I think yeah. one pitch was. was. Yeah, something silly. Like something like how it just, you're just mind boggling. And yeah, no, I totally get it. You guys are, you guys have your, uh, your fan base, your loyalties, and obviously you're going to be biased towards your team, right? Of like course. it's, it's, I totally get it. Totally get it. You guys uh, probably didn't know this either that. The one and only Kyle Higashoka, uh, him and I live in the same town in the middle of nowhere. Really? And uh, he's my workout. He's my workout buddy in the off season. Oh, oh wow. Oh, really? Wow. That's awesome. That's yeah. The, the home, the home run guy himself, home run stroker, according to the, uh, <laughs> the announcer. That's, that's really cool. You know, he made a great pairing with Cole last year. I really like that dynamic as with Cole because they were together in California for a little bit, but that's a really yeah. fun fact. I had no idea. That's really cool. Oh, it's really nice to throw off season bullpens to, to Kyle. I mean, you're, I've thrown to a lot of good catchers and Kyle's right up there with them. I mean, I've been fortunate to throw to Barnhart and Real Muto. Um, but then to have Kyle in the off season uh, is just been incredible to helping me, uh, you know, kind of reinvent all, all my pitches the last year and a half. He's been a big help to me in the off season, but I, uh, you got to give it anybody that's been a Yankee for 13 years. I mean, the longest tenured Yankee in the system uh, is uh, obviously pretty set in the, uh, the way he does things. And people, one thing that really gets uh, tossed around is like, you know, just being a professional and like Kyle, Kyle's professional. Like I like watching him go about his work every single day, just consistent, quiet and does his job. Like that's something that you just, you can't beat. And, some guy that I, one guy that I'm always pulling for, and I'm always pumped to see him in the lineup. And I hope that he gets a chance to stay there for a long time and, and catch Cole because that's a good guy to, to get to catch every every fifth day. Yeah, yeah. So um, I want to ask you about your experience so far in the in the Korean league, and uh, what do you like about it? And obviously, you have great numbers there, 15 and four with a 2.50 ERA so far. And um, what what do you like about it? And uh, can you speak the language now since you the, since you've been there? No, I can't speak the language at all. I have an interpreter. He's great. Um, but I just enjoy I was coming at a place where I was leaving Baltimore. I had a torn meniscus. I was not able to throw a baseball. I it, it just was not just baseball was not fun in 2019. Like nothing about it was fun. Um, I got a chance to come over here, had my knee cleaned up, got back to work. Literally, I throw I threw three pitches. I, changed, I fixed my slider, changed my changeup, added a curveball, added a cutter, um, fully healthy, baseball's fun again, over here pitching, having a lot of success. Like, I needed it. I needed to come over here and do this. I, it was kind of like one of those things where I was at a point in my career where I was like, I either just need to go home or I need to get back to work and reinvent some stuff and, and keep grinding. And uh, going home was never even a thought. It was just like, let's get back to work. Let's reinvent. Let's keep going. And so – Got to do that was very fortunate that people over here felt that I'd be good on their team. Um, and obviously things last year went very well professionally. And so uh, it was great. It was a great relationship formed. Um, you know, I immediately went to some of my teammates and learned some of their pitches. That's where I learned the curveball from. And then a guy that's our head of R&D helped me learn the cutter this last off season. So just really keep like trying to, to get better every single day as a ball player. Um, with the goal of trying to come back to the States and pitch an MLB again. I've never been shy about saying that. That's always been my goal is to come back and play so my son can watch me pitch in the big leagues mm. at an age that he'll remember. And we're getting, we're getting close to that age. He's three and a half now. So maybe he'll remember that age or he'll start to remember things, you know, for, for life here in the next year or two. And so that's what I'm working for. I'm working to try to get back. Um, but while I'm here, I'm having a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. The atmosphere is just so different than it is at MLB. I mean, there's, cheerleaders and singing fight songs and cheer songs for whenever you're hitting it's kind of like a basketball game and a baseball game in the states kind of inter intertwined except the songs that they sing are about the players on the on the floor or on the court like you know they're about the players on the field 
And so um, they just, everybody has their own cheer song and fight song and, and the fans do the dances and the songs while the game's going on. And it's just something that you'd have to see in person to really like understand. Um, but it's part of the culture of the game here and it's really fun to see. And so, uh, albeit I've only seen it at 25% capacity, uh, it's been nice to see that. And so I needed this. I've had a lot of fun with it and uh, I'm just ready to go for, for your number two over here. Hmm. Speaking of, oh, sorry, just a follow up. Speaking of, since you said, all right, since you said you're, you're trying to come back in the majors and uh, if, if once you do, um, we, had, let me ask you this has any uh, teams contacted you do uh, recently when you're still when you're in Korea or um, has has any teams contacted you yet for, for a comeback so when you're a free agent is when you get to talk to teams when yeah. you're when you're working for a team you're like you have a contract you don't get to talk to teams okay so when I was a free agent yes we had conversations but Korea came back and offered enough money that you just have to be like okay I'll come back for one more season oh. for you um, because ultimately my wife and son and providing for them comes first and foremost, yeah. right. Providing for my family, setting up a future for life for us to live comfortably as we can. Um, is, is, is a big part of the, the, the piece of why I'm still playing. And so like, you have to just keep, keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was conversations to be had, but, and we had those conversations, but at the end of the day, like, I just wasn't going to sit around and wait for, uh, another couple of weeks for to to see if anybody was making better offers when I had an offer over here. You know, yeah. sometimes you just have to to make a decision as a man and as a leader of your family. And uh, we did that. But yeah, I think that uh, the COVID season had something to play into it as well. Um, you know, there was no one had budgets. No one knew what next year was going to look like. There was a lot of unknowns and I had an offer in the hand. So I took it. But, um, you know, the goal is to just come over here again, keep working and see what happens next year. That's really awesome. And I was going to ask that question too. So I'm happy Nathan asked it and I wish you the best of luck as you try to get back to the major leagues and hopefully you crush it again this year. So I'm going to ask you a Yankees related question now. Who was the tough, who was the toughest Yankees hitter you had to face or some of the toughest Yankees guys you went against? I never had to face a fully loaded Yankee lineup. I never, never did. Um, (laughs) I'm surprised. uh, No, like back in the day, like every time I would like A-Rod was hurt or Jeter was hurt, uh, somebody wasn't playing, somebody had the day off. Like it was just kind of like one of those situations. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I just kind of got lucky in the timing of it. Um, Trying to think more current Yankees. I think that. I think Torres has got something special going on. I don't know what he did last year. I got to be honest. I didn't really follow a whole lot. Yeah, the tough year, actually. Yeah, but I, I think he's going to be a special ball player. I think that, uh, that the, you know, the Cubs got their World Series out of, out of that trade. And then you guys got Chapman back and you got Torres as well. So I think that's a good move for, for everybody involved. But I think he's going to be a, a pretty special guy. And I think he's a pretty good – I think he's a pretty damn good hitter. So – uh, other than that, though, like uh, to just say the absolute toughest guy is really hard as a pitcher because everybody's tough. It's the big leagues. Like it just is like and everybody has different matchups that some guys some guys might look at this whole thing and be like, yeah, Mike Trout's not really that tough for me to face. And for some guys, that's probably true. And for some guys, they'd be like, oh, man, like, you know, like Kyle Higashioka is the hardest out in the big leagues for me. Like you just never know who that is right. like at any level. But um so to sit here and say like the toughest guy, i don't really remember the absolute toughest guy um maybe might even be a little going back to just a guy that i've just have a hard time getting out um oh he's just the type of guy that you just like you got to hope he hits it at somebody because it's hard to get a swing and miss and it's hard to get a chase and so you just kind of go after and you got you got to let him put the ball in play right and you just got to hope he hits it at somebody so i'd say between those two guys for me is probably two of the two of the tougher outs on that team right now. Definitely. Uh, one of my last questions for you is what is the hardest pitch to learn and to throw? Ooh. I would say the hundred mile an hour fastball impossible to learn. Um, but seriously, I think for me, it was uh, a spiked curveball. It's the pitch I throw now, but like I had, Years ago, I was playing catch with Zach Gallon, and he was throwing me his curveball. And I was like, how do you 
like, how do you hold this? And he showed me and I was like, there's no chance I can do this. And we were like looking at the spike on it. And I was like, how do you throw a ball with your finger like that? Like that makes no sense to me. Uh, and it just took a lot, a lot of reps for me to feel any sort of comfortable with it and just kept, kept going, kept going. And finally now it feels fine. But that was, that was a, that was a monster for me to try to learn. Hmm. Definitely. I thought, um, is, is your spike curve ball sort of like a knuckle, you throw like a knuckle curve? No, it's like, just, you just like pull your finger back. Okay. Like the, what, yeah. You, when, when you have your fingers here, your fingers get in the way. All those high speed cameras we use uh, are amazing tools and help us skip a lot of steps in like the learning curve. And basically my finger was clipping the ball. So spiking it, uh, pulling the finger back, any, anything, everybody does it a little different, but the idea of the knuckle curve or the spike curve, all that kind of stuff is really just getting that index finger off the baseball sooner so that the ball can rotate over the middle finger is really the, the ultimate goal of what most people are trying to do with it. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. I did not know that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I got a couple more things here before we let you go. Uh, I want to get to your podcast here. Uh, when, when did your podcast come about, and how 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 often do you guys do it? And uh, what do you like? What do you guys? Uh, how often? Do, uh, let me let me say this. How how often do you guys do your podcast? Uh, we do it. We did it weekly all summer last year. Uh, we started opening week and did uh, Mondays and Thursdays episodes the entire baseball season and then we've had kind of intermittent randomly off-season episodes and then since we've gotten back in over to korea uh we've had probably about every 10 days or so we've been able to release an episode yeah. and uh pretty soon we're going to be jumping in once the season starts we actually have some schedule so we'll be able to jump in with the time change it's been a little challenging but we've been able to establish that tuesday mornings will be our time to record and yeah, we just, uh, me and my buddy, I was out here by myself and it was a way for us to hang out, give me something to do, gave me, help me pass time being away from my family. Um, anybody that's ever spent time away from their family understands how hard that is. And yeah. this was a really good outlet for me to, uh, to, to help, to, to help with that, to kind of, to, to just make that feel closer to home for me. Um, but the podcast, the whole concept was, was telling my story, but telling them my story and with the eyes of like how it's really comfortable or really, uh, really similar to a lot of other guys in professional sports and professional baseball specifically. Um, on Thursdays, we just talked about every single stop I ever took from every single team, every single place I played all the way up from low A or short season A ball up through South Korea. And then on Mondays we had, we caught up on the KBO and then we had guests, um, uh, players, strength coaches, we had uh, commentators, personalities, writers, everybody that's involved in baseball. We try to get somebody from every single department that you could possibly think of and hear their journey because baseball is so much more than just the players on the field. We wanted to hear how, how John Shambi, how, how Boog Shambi got from being just a baseball fan to the Chicago Cubs announcer we heard from mina kimes how she became uh -huh. it was just uh how she came over here to korea to write about baseball and how she's back and obviously she's doing nfl stuff mostly um we got to hear her story we heard stories from alex fast who writes for pitchers list and does some mlb content stuff like he's really like hearing how he how his journey into baseball went we heard from uh rachel luba how her journey through baseball was and so we really just heard many different aspects and angles um, from as many different people as we could possibly think of and get a hold of to come and tell their stories um, in a different realm. And it's also kind of interesting too, as a, as a player, I've been in hundreds of interviews. And so I've, I've got a chance to experience a lot of different ways interviews happen. And I've obviously have my preferred ways or preferred questions and all this type of stuff. So I was able to kind of hopefully like, use some of that into asking questions and to, to, to engaging in the conversation and just to keep it going, I've, I've really enjoyed being able to kind of flip that and be the one interviewing the writers and the reporters. That's been fun for me. Yeah. So uh, where can we where can we find your podcast if people want to tune in, listen to it? Where, where can they find it? Anywhere that you get your podcast, whether it's on Spotify, Apple, just anything. Uh, it's just the Journeyman podcast. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. It's really it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, we got the I got the shirt on right now yeah. um, and we're starting up some stuff on YouTube. And so we're rolling through it. We got a, we got the vlog going this year. We're just going to have some fun with it and see where it goes. But uh, really at the end of the day, it's just about trying to tell the story and mm -hmm. trying to have some fun and uh, really just kind of give some, 
some access to the fan base over here, especially too, that doesn't really have access to the players that much. Uh, just give them some content and give them some, some sort of idea of what it's like to be a ball player out here in the KBO. I really like that. I'm definitely going to check that out. Sounds like a lot of cool stories. Definitely see what's going on with that. I'm sure it'll be a great list and, and I'm going to build on that as well. So what advice would you give to some younger guys that are coming into the majors and maybe how they should handle things or like what they should do if things aren't going so well, I guess. I think the biggest advice I was ever given that I try to pass forward is that anybody that gets the call, they don't just hand the ball to somebody in the big right. leagues. They don't just hand out at bats to somebody in the big leagues. Um, so if they're giving you the ball, if they're giving you the at bat, it's because you've earned it and you deserve it. And so trust yourself. Like they didn't, like they didn't call people up. They didn't call you up to to be somebody you're not. They called you up to be yourself. They called you up to to be the best version of yourself. So just trust your skills and keep going. I think that's one thing that really um, guys put pressure on themselves. Guys artificial pressure on themselves to do more than they're capable of when the teams just want them to be themselves. Hmm. Interesting. That's a good answer. I think they'd like hearing that too. Hmm. So a couple, a couple of things here for me. Uh, what, what would you say your most memorable game that you played in in the Korea League so far? It was my last game last year. Um, only a handful of guys have ever gotten 200 strikeouts in this league, mm-hmm. and I came into the game uh, four shy, and so I came in and uh, was able to pass that pretty quick. So it was fun to to have that memory of getting getting over the mark, um, but also to just help me aim my sights higher for this year and going into the season of trying to become the, the single season all-time strikeout leader wow. um, in Korea is my goal. So that's really the, the thought. I saw how much fun that was, and now I just want to do it a little bit better. Did, did they give you a nickname? Oh, the K-King. Yeah, yeah. they uh, got, a tro- <laughs> got a trophy, got some shirts, got everything. Nice. So they, uh, yeah, they like, they love, they love their nickname names over here um and the uh yeah it's it's just it's a whole different animal i wish you guys could experience it like to just to see what it's i wish every baseball fan could see what it's like over here but yeah i know the uh the fans they've been they they had k king on there pretty quick i was i had a lot of uh a lot of images sent my way of me wearing a crown the moment that i i got to the the strikeout record for the league last year got the the league leading strikeout holder for the year and so they they love throwing that title around Hmm. So the last two things here before we let you go, uh, our the our full team is part of the Hugh Jackson Foundation. Um, obviously, he's a former NFL coach, but he's trying to get back into coaching. So we're ambassadors for them. We're trying to help prevent human trafficking and making sure these kids make the right choices and making sure the community is safer. So I'm going to send you the, the page, send you the page after this so you can check it out. And we're really grateful to to be part of this foundation. I just want to bring that up so people. I, I always bring it up yeah. so people can check it out. And the last thing here, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors, and essential workers right now? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm actually married to a nurse. My wife um, has been a nursing off and on for a few years. Uh, but just really, my brother-in-law is a paramedic on the front lines. My uncle's a paramedic on the front line. So like, it's very common, uh, very common stuff. A lot of my friends back home are nurses and firefighters. And so uh, I know it's been said a lot this last year, and we've all recognized this, but like really just thankful for for you and for everything that people have have been willing to put on the line to help protect the masses Uh, i see it a lot firsthand and i see the some of the scary moments and i've heard some of the scary stories but um you know i think we as a general public just really appreciate you and like really really grateful for what you're willing to do and go through just to help keep us a little bit safer thank you yeah well said and tell your wife i said thank you for for her service you bet. Nathan, would I be able to get something in quicker? Oh, yeah. Is he yeah. going to go oh, now? Oh, you can go. Okay, so this is our logo here. Yeah. We had it before, nice. but let me get out of the way. <laughs> I'm struggling. All right, well, that's there the logo. Go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Gun Talks MLB is our company that Nathan was talking about. Me and Bobby are a part of that. We have football and baseball content on there. We do articles. We also have a YouTube channel where we talk about nice. a lot of plays like baseball, football. We have a card shop. We're having. We're going to get merchandise going soon, so – just wanted to give you some awareness of that. And my last question for you is actually going to be about pitchers hitting. What are your thoughts on the universal DH? Like, should they just adopt that in MLB? Like, as, as a pitcher, how do you feel hitting in the KBO? Do the pitchers hit? No, right? No, we we have we have we have a DH here. Oh. Um, I I loved hitting. I was almost the worst hitter in Major League history. Um, oh for 49 to start my career. 
Um, <laughs> oh my God. But I, but I was a damn good bunner. <laughs> and then, so I really like that part of it. Um, I think it brings a lot of strategy to the game and having to deal with that, that last batting spot and having to deal with, it makes, it makes bench players more important. It makes pitchers want to be better hitters because otherwise your outings are shorter. Right. Like there's so many times that I got taken out like at 80 pitches because work to try to be a better hitter and part of it was I mean like I hadn't I hadn't touched a bat in 10 years and all of a sudden I'm in an Oakland A's uniform facing the Pirates and I'm facing Garrett Cole for my first at bat in 10 years wow I get I get in the box and I look at Russell Martin I'm like I'm like where do I where do I stand (laughs) he's like like, "It, it doesn't matter man just stand anywhere you want and that's just the truth of it like so being an American League team coming up like I wasn't taught or spent any time hitting so working on that backwards, like all of a sudden now I'm in Cincinnati hitting every single day. It took me 50 at bats just to get a wow. hit. But then I think the next year I got like four or five hits and then the next year, five hits again. So like it was, I got better, but That's I cool. was always a good, I was always a good bunter. And so that brought a lot of strategy. Um, scariest at bat of my life though, is we got to run around third base and one out and the facing the Cardinals and Wainwright. Huh. And I get to a three, two count and I get the squeeze sign. Wow. Oh, wow. three, pretty, two suicide wild, squeeze. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, but that was my, that was my only asset. That's the only thing I'm bringing to the table is I can get a bunt down. I don't care who's pitching. I don't care what pitch it is. I can get the bunt down and it worked. I got the RBI. So nice. it was, uh, wow. but like, we got to find some so having, this. <laughs> having, having, the, having that skill, like was I was very proud of, but I can't say I was a good hitter. I'm all for the the pitchers hitting. Um, at the same breath, I also had a season shortened because I had strain oblique from from hitting. Wow. So yeah. I I totally get it, but like that happens to hitters too. And my strain oblique wasn't from a lack of stretching or a lack of of muscle memory. It's just I think the combined body strain of pitching with hitting maybe had something to do with it but at the end of the day like it's just part of being an athlete is dealing with injuries and injury prevention and everything else and hydration and sleep and diet and everything that goes into it and so who knows what actually caused an oblique strain? it just happened to be in that situation so it kind of i get i truly i truly get both sides of the conversation but i just love the strategy and i love getting in the batter's box and just that feeling of getting it hit in the big leagues is probably the coolest thing ever hmm. Yeah, I'm done the side of the pitchers shouldn't hit just because you see what happened. We brought up Zach Gallon and Kyle Hendricks, and there was some stuff that happened with them. Hendricks had a scare. Gallon got injured hitting, I think, or something. So it's tough. But, I mean, you actually did it, so I'll have to tip my hat to you, obviously. If you want the pitchers to hit, let's let the pitchers hit. So yeah. it's going to be Yeah, and if every, if every pitcher got in there and was able to hit, like, area and Baumgartner and um, – like hit like that then it'd be a different story everyone would be like but then yeah. you also got me and way in chin that were like two of the worst hitters and we were on the same team and so like you just got to deal with different we got to deal with it all but uh so i, I totally see the, the ordeal or if michael lorenzen no one cares about that because he can actually hit oh he's and a so I, think, I, I, I think but i think it all plays into it but if you knew your whole life like hey as a pitcher like if you get to the big leagues you're gonna hit then i think we would work on it our whole lives and we're still good athletes. So I think we would be able to be better at it, but we don't work on it. We don't work on it at all. It's like watching a position player get on the mound and they haven't pitched for 10 years. It looks uncomfortable. They they throw 50 miles an hour and you're like, why are they even out there? Well, it's no different. We didn't work on hitting for 10 years, except now I got to face Garrett Cole in the big leagues. Like no wonder I'm failing. Like no one, I wasn't set up for success. And so I think part of it too, part of the conversation is just, if you just eliminate that, then you just get a better quality on the field, better product on the field. But then those few guys that are really good at it, they kind of they, they take t- taking away part of their game from them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Baumgartner is a great example. I think one game he actually DH, like they didn't use the DH, like they let him yeah. do it. Like, it was in Oakland. Ace. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. Like, it's just stuff that you don't see or stuff you don't hear of. And then the other one too, I think it's Pat Pat Corbin. We were going into Arizona one year, and he like had like eighteen hits. Wow, and was batting like three fifty, hmm. and you're just like, what? Like what? Yes. And he hit, and he had a triple off me that night, and I was like, "Of course he did, yeah. of course he did." This guy's just a hit machine. So, um, but we're talking about somebody batting 
you know, once every fifth day, like that's tough, man. Like that's tough. Like you're not seeing pitches, especially major league pitches that much. Like it's hard to get in there and, and yeah. it's hard to, it's hard to pull the triggers. What it's hard to do. It's hard to swing. Like you want to swing, but I was just like, so like always in between. Cause it just, everything happens so fast up there. Hmm. Yeah, that's an awesome answer. And you gave us some great insight. I really appreciate you doing this. It was a lot of fun. We learned a lot guys. of fun things and um, a lot of nice, even some cool Yankees talk too. Yeah. So that was fun. Yeah, so I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, this wraps up episode 724 for the NR Hour Sports Show. And we would like to have you back as a returning guest at some point so you can meet the full team. My co-host Alyssa too. And she's uh, she's busy covering the uh, March Madness. So unfortunately they can't join, but Hopefully we get you back on soon, but keep up the great work. Uh, good luck this season, man. And uh, You're a great pitcher, obviously, and uh, um, hopefully, hopefully you come back to, into the majors at some point. So, yes. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, Take care, and we'll see you next time. Luck. Yeah, stay safe. I love to stay yeah, in touch. You. I message you on Instagram, too. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank uh, you.